or two. Yep.
Good, af good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is everybody here? Good afternoon. <laughs> Just clapping. Good afternoon, everyone. Could I have everybody take their seats, please, so we can begin the program? I've been to a lot of events as a faculty member and as a dean, and I've never seen this much excitement in a room. Um, I usually only have to say everybody come together once, but no, this is great. I actually have been waiting for this as well as our trailblazers for well over two and a half years. I woke up at four this morning, turned to my wife and said, it's, it's the day we're doing this. And she goes, it's four in the morning. And so, <laughs> and so I've been up since. It's a joyous day for everyone, and we are just thrilled. So I want to extend um, from the School of Social Work and the University a heartfelt welcome to all the family members, friends, community members, our trailblazers, Ms. Gloria Bryant Banks, Ms. Marilyn Piper, and Ms. Curly Harden Elwa here today. As you may have figured out, our school doesn't normally look this way. Um, it has been transformed into a podcasting, video casting, everything for this event and as well as the event. And I'd like to thank our staff, our administrative team, our faculty, our student ambassadors, it, everyone. I'd like to give them a round of applause because this took a lot of work. <laughs> so in general, I'm going to kind of lead us through the program and there's a lot of great people that are going to speak. But we are here to recognize, and I'm sure you all know this, and I call them all by their first name with Miss, because I'm used to doing that. Um, Miss Gloria, Miss Marilyn, and Miss Pearlie. So Miss Gloria and Miss Marilyn were the first black students to graduate from Tulane University. Miss Pearlie. <laughs> now I'm going to lose my place multiple times, which has happened since we've been doing this together all the time. Dinners have been fun together. Um, and also, Ms. Pearlie, who graduated the next year afterwards, she stood up in the litigation against Tulane U University to integrate the university. So all three of our trailblazers played a significant impact in how this university has been shaped from back then in the 60s up till today in the transformative change we are going through right now. Also, they are the first three black graduates of our social work program in the school. So there are a lot of firsts but it also has blazed the trail for them and others to come after them. As you will learn about each one of their accomplishments, if you look in the, the program, we could have probably filled that out with another 20 pages each of their social work careers here in Louisiana, whether it was child welfare, whether it was in the school systems, it was making a difference when families in our communities, as we all do as social workers. Their legacy far exceeds the accomplishments that I could ever talk about during this thing and the countless individuals they'd help. Right now, I'd like to have informant up here to say some remarks. Thank you, Patrick. And first of all, I want to uh, begin by sending the regrets from President Fitz. Uh, uh, he, some of you may know a week ago he tested positive for COVID and he was planning to be here and sends his regrets and is deeply saddened. He can't join us for this uh, occasion. I also want to welcome everyone here to, uh, uh, to this very special day, especially those of you who are not Tulanians by nature, but from now on, from this day on, you are Tulanians. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here. I want to thank you for braving that circular parking lot uh, in order to get you right here. My fear is there are people who want to be here today but who are still circling out there, and they'll, they'll join us when they can. But uh, anyway, thank you to all of you for, for being here. The fact that you're here makes this day so much more meaningful for all of us, and uh, I hope this won't be your last visit if it is your first to, uh, to Tulane. And Patrick, I want to thank you for hosting us today at the School of Social Work, and thank you for stewarding this critically important Trailblazers initiative. This is part of a new university-wide initiative to recognize those whose stories are fundamentally part of Tulane stories but whose images and voices were often missing. We suggested our three honorees to Patrick in the early stages of the recognition process, and Patrick took over at that point, and then he brilliantly turned to native New Orleanian turned internationally recognized artist Terence Osborne. 
In Terence, he found the perfect person to tell this remarkable story, an artist whose work not only expresses the bond between New Orleans and its people, but also one who truly captures the diverse, creative, and vibrant city of New Orleans. So Patrick and Terence, your passion for this project was clear since the very first discussions about honoring uh, three of the first African-American students to matriculate through the university. And I want to thank you both for, uh, for the role you played. Um, as Patrick uh, already said, our honorees are Gloria Bryant Banks, class of 64, Pearlie Hardin Elwa, class of 65, and Marilyn S. Piper, class of 64. And I am so pleased and honored that you are all able to join us for this celebration. Uh, so let's give our honorees one more round of applause. I will say before they were talking that they should be honored just for their ability to come and join us today. But, but uh, honestly, I think that they could, they could beat me in a race. So I'm not going to say anything more about their age. Um, you know, in April of 2019, President Fitz established the Trailblazers Initiative to recognize and celebrate Tulaneans from diverse backgrounds. Our charge, our charge is to better and more truthfully understand our history and how we got to this point and where we wish to go. To not only honor those who have paved the way for others who have made meaningful contributions to the university becoming more equitable, diverse, and inclusive, but also to recognize those who've taken their Tulane education into the world and forever changed our communities for the better. Gloria, Pearlie, and Marilyn have done just that. Since setting foot on our campuses, they have each been a continual reminder of what's possible at our School of Social Work. Their Tulane journey set into motion more than half a century of promise of change and of progress for our institution. We know, we know that this is not entirely a proud story for Tulane. Gloria, Pearlie, and Marilyn, I've read about your student days, but the truth is it's hard for me to imagine how difficult it must have been how brave you must have been to be three of Tulane's first people of color in a newly integrated university. So today we celebrate your courage and your perseverance. We celebrate the fact that by fighting through the challenges you faced and successfully graduating, you changed the story of Tulane. And we celebrate all that you've accomplished since. Each of you took your Tulane degree and enhanced the lives of others. You are the embodiment of Tulane's motto, not for oneself, but for one's own. Gloria Bryant Banks graduated from Tulane and went on to serve as secretary for the Louisiana State Department of Social Services. Yes. Pearlie Hardin Elwa took her Tulane degree and became director of the Office of Children, Youth, and Families at Total Community Action before directing her own Head Start Center, providing high quality care and learning to children from all walks of life. And Marilyn Piper rose the ranks of her field to become the head of child protection for the state of Louisiana, while also serving as an adjunct professor here at Tulane. <laughs> Our story, Tulane's story, is not complete without their stories. And I am deeply proud, deeply proud that from this day forward, their heroic stories will be front and center. Our School of Social Work's motto is to do work that matters. It is certainly the case that all three of your careers personify that motto, but even more so, very few of our graduates can claim the type of extraordinary impact you've had on this institution and on every Tulanean who calls our university home. This is a momentous day for Tulane one that we've all looked forward to since before the pandemic struck when we announced the School of Social Work's three iconic trailblazers. So ladies, thank you again for all that you've done for Tulane University, the city of New Orleans, and the state of Louisiana. And uh, we will have the opportunity from hearing from each of them this afternoon, and we'll also have a very special tribute to unveil. So now let me reintroduce the impresario for the afternoon, Dean of Tulane School of Social Work, Patrick Bordnick. But first, once again, Let's hear it for today's honorees. Those of you. 
Thank you, Provost Foreman. Those of you that know me, I never have a script until I met our honorees. They like things a certain way, if that doesn't <laughs> ring a bell. <laughs> she, she heard you, you were laughing at grandma. Um, but no, it's, it, I get it, and, and that's what I really love about these three women, is who's gonna speak first? They told us, so my assistant, Suad, who's been instrumental, said, you have to make sure that Miss Pearlie speaks first. <laughs> I, I've been having nightmares ever since that I get up and say the wrong name, I don't know. But I don't know if they plotted something, I hope so, because it will be joyous. So please, please let me introduce, I can't say my favorite, because you're all are my favorites, un unless they're by themselves. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Miss Pearlie to give us a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I want to just do a little switch around because part of why I'm here today, I will speak to you about those people who brought me to that point, those people who shared this journey with me. But I want us to pause first to think about one thing. The provost mentioned uh, what we must have suffered uh, what we must have felt being the first three people of color on this campus. But I want you to remember this. How many of you remember your first day in school? Raise your hand. That's all? <laughs> okay, all right, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. But those of you who can remember being five or six, the whole family excited because the baby is going to school to join the older sisters and brothers. Mama has dressed you up, shine your face, shine your shoes, kiss you for a million times and say, have a good day. Now that was a momentous occasion for all of us. But just think about these four little girls. And those of you who go back, I want you to think about them as I call the name. Little Miss Ruby Bridges, Little Miss Tefsy Provost, Little Miss Gail Etta-Ang, and Little Miss Leona Tate. Those little girls came to school their first day in the midst of hatred, people spitting at them, calling them nasty names, doing all kinds of things, but they persevered. So I want to start my talk, my few words, by remembering not just these four young girls, but remembering their mothers. Just think how those mothers felt, letting their little girls leave the house without their protection, without the love of family, and face the kind of crowd that they faced. So let's give those four young girls a hand. They help bring us to this point too. Now, uh, Dr. Benjamin Mays had a poem and he says, I have only just a minute. I wanna paraphrase it a little bit and said, I only have five minutes. They gave us five minutes. <laughs> And somebody said, I've used four of them already. <laughs> I probably have, but some things I think are necessary, you know? <laughs> and since I didn't have any long suffering at Tulane, then take that as my suffering. <laughs> the fact that I got to cut this down to five minutes, okay? <laughs> but Dr. Benjamin May says, I have only just a minute only 60 seconds in it, forced on me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. 
And so the eternity, I am so happy to be here with my fellow Dillites, all of us fellows finished from Dillard University, you know, and I'm so happy to share this occasion with them. The African proverb says, as long as you speak my name, I shall live forever. And so I speak the names of those people who forge my path for me. First and foremost, to the person who taught me to read very early in life and instilled in me the love of learning and the pursuit of knowledge. Okay, Generation G, this was many years before Google and Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, my mother, Ms. Zel Maggie Zelma Lewis Hardin. She helped forge me to this point. Ms. Verdell Truitt, my preschool teacher, I know my family tired of hearing me mention that lady's name, but we went to preschool in a church basement. Every single afternoon, Ms. Verdell Truitt would walk all of us home. And so the first group of kids would leave and then here comes the next group. But she was a wonderful, and I shall never ever forget it. You see, I still remember her name. And who mentioned our age? Somebody <laughs> mentioned our age. <laughs> he did? Oh, that's right. Thank you, Banks. Thank you. <laughs> but she was so important to me in instilling in me whatever she did and her love for us. And there are still a couple of people walking around Houston who went to preschool with me. Okay? All right. My next person, Miss Cleveland. Miss Cleveland was a high school teacher, and she was my Latin teacher for four years. I took four years of Latin in a public school, everybody. <laughs> in a public school in Houston, Texas. Her teaching was so graphic that more than 25 years later, when I saw the white cliffs of Dover, walk the Appian Way, sail on the Venetian canals, and visited the Sistine Chapel. It was like I was revisiting. It wasn't like I was there for the first time. So I see somebody in the back doing this. So she probably had that kind of teacher too. You know, teachers who just brought things to life for you. And these were the some of the people who forged the way for me. Next, I'll speak the names of those persons who demonstrated to me the essence of being a social worker. And both Gloria and Marilyn know who I'm speaking of. Dr. Millie Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Millie was, uh, was working at child welfare when I started. And I remember the first time I saw Millie. She was coming up the walk, the hall. She had a stack of papers. The papers were falling all off. And she was talking to everybody left and right. And I said, who is that? Oh, they said, that's Millie Charles. <laughs> such energy, such innovative approaches to working with children and families. She made me see early in my career that it could be exciting and fun and rewarding working on behalf of young children and their families. Miss Juanita Wilkinson, still Magnolia number one. Soft-spoken, true Southern lady. Miss Wilkinson was the one who had to call me in her office and say to me, you're being fired. What did I do? You sued Tulane University. Oh, they're going to fire me for that? Yes. <laughs> and she had tears streaming. I said, Ms. Wilkinson, it's not that important. I'm young. I'm going to make it in this world. But she was such a kind, was she not a kind Southern lady, a kind Southern lady of color, you know. And so she's what I call still Magnolia number two. 
Secondly, I speak of those persons who walked with me on that Tulane journey. First one, Barbara Marie Guillory Thompson. Barbara and I started this journey together. Every day when we went to court, she, somebody picked her up first and then picked me up. And you know, in the Southern tradition, the oldest girl is always given due respect. And when mama left the house, she left everybody under the care of big sister. So I sort of fell into that thing with Barbara. Barbara was older than me. So whatever Barbara said that we were gonna do or wear or talk or say or not say, that's what I did. But I shall never forget, she is no longer with us, but I shall never forget that it was Barbara who led this whole initiative. And she was a joy to work with and a joy to be around every single day. The next person's name I speak is Dr. John Fury. Dr. Fury was our history teacher. He was the one who reached out and touched us and said, I want you two girls. He was so famous for calling us girls. <laughs> so why are you calling us? We're not girls. I want you girls, and he said it again, <laughs> to Sue Tulane. And when he said that, Barbara and I looked at one another and said, well, what are we suing him for? So then he told us the whole story. But he was such a fighter. And as you can see by his name, you know, he was an Irishman. So we used to call him the fighting Irishman. On St. Patrick's Day, you better wear green or you got put out of his class. <laughs> the next person whose name I speak is Dr. Daniel C. Thompson. He gave us full moral support, encouragement, and I can hear him to this day and say, Bob and Pearly, you can do it. I mean, he never let us waver in our belief that we could approach this with the knowledge that we had been prepared for the work at Tulane University. Then there was Dr. I mean, Attorney John Nelson. I wish he had someone in the audience today talking about a truly morally upright Southern gentleman, very courageous, to take on this case in that day and time took a lot of courage because I'm sure he lost clients, I'm sure he lost money, I'm sure he lost a lot of things, but look what he gained and he never ever wavered in his approach to Barbara and to me. He gave us a, we gonna do a spirit that kept us going. Okay. And then my Magnolia number two, Miss Rosa Freeman Keller. Miss Keller was born Rosa Freeman. She was born in a very wealthy family. And she didn't quite understand, I had no knowledge of all of the prejudices and the issues that people of color and people of differences face until she married a man of Jewish heritage. And then I think that brought to mind that because it was so close to home then. And so Miss Keller used her influence to mold the world around her, to mold the institutions around her. And I can remember her saying, Pearly and Barbara, she had the most beautiful Southern voice. And she wouldn't say just Barbara, she said Barbara to go on for about two hours, you know. <laughs> but what she did, the, our first day on campus, she had someone pick us up, brought us to her house, and gave us a key. And she said, if ever you need the safety of this house, here's the key. But we never needed it. We never did, you know. But to think that this woman would take that kind of step to make sure that even if she wasn't home, we had the freedom 
to go into a place where we felt safe. Okay. And so those are the people who walked this Tulane journey with me and who was so much a part of where we are today and what Gloria and Marilyn and I are doing on this day. So just in case you think, those of you think I'm honoring people and not too many men, I'm gonna talk about two men, just very briefly. The first man is the late Judge Charles L. Elwell, who shared his resolve and his fearfulness with me. He never ever wavered, he never ever once said, uh, I'm afraid for you. He, his whole thing was, oh, you can do it, you know, and that's the kind of man that he was. And so I speak his name in honor of what he was to me in this journey. And last, I speak the name, remembering my father, Mr. Lowell Harden, with these two words, and I think there are two people in the audience who will know what I mean when I say, ooh, we Lord, thank you. <laughs> Wow, I've learned a lot of lessons tonight as well as over the past two and a half years. You are my favorite, but I'm going to introduce my favorite. Um, <laughs> actually, this person doesn't live far from my house and has let me know that many times. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Miss Gloria to give us a few words. She just, she just looked at me and said, a few words, as many words as you'd like us to give. She's never had a few words. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. If you think I'm not happy and excited, you're wrong. I am so happy and excited on this day. For me, this day is double fold. We are here in 2022. I don't want you to look at me today. I want you to think about me, envision me in 1963. 1963, 1963, 58 years ago. Now, I was a little girl on my way to do other things and was sidetracked to come to Tulane University. So here I am, 58 years later, 58 years later, for the first time that Tulane is saying, thanks. We're glad that you are part of us. We're glad you passed our way. I'm going to uh, talk about my experiences at Tulane and uh, bring you up to date on where I am now. On Tulane's campus, it was bittersweet and happiness for me because I had come into an environment where there were mixed emotions from others about my being here. But being the person I am, with the foundation from Christian parents, nurtured in the Baptist faith, and forward being told that, honey, you can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. And that's what I grew up with all of my life from my parents who are not learned from the books, but both of them had the wisdom of Solomon and it helped to get me where I am today. 
So on Tulane's campus, I was interviewed on the day of graduation, June 1963. And uh, the uh, instructor, the professor who interviewed me, Marilyn, what was her name? Miss Van? Van Van Davendock. See how happy I am to remember her name. <laughs> she was the most beautiful soul that anyone would want to meet on a journey. She interviewed me and it was, it, it was just great being there with her. She was very kind, she was very interested, and so I felt very good about being there with her. The only downfall with, uh, with her was that she was a chain smoker. And so by the time I left her office, my hair, my clothes, all the way down, I was smelling like smoke. And so that didn't make me very happy. I left here and I went home. And uh, when I got home, my mother said, uh, well, how did you do? How did it go? And I said, uh, Ma, if anybody's going to Tulane University, it's me. I said, I feel very good about the interview. And so she said, well, uh, come on, honey. I got some, some coffee ready for us, so uh, let's just sit down and have some coffee. And my part of the black culture, where we took care of business, was at the kitchen table over a cup of coffee. <laughs> and that coffee uh, could cure anything. If you had a headache, give you a cup of coffee. If you had a toy ache, give you a cup of coffee. That, that's just the way it was. So from there, the interview went on, went very well. I told my parents about it. And um, then um, it was mine to be accepted about a week later uh, by Tulane to enter. And I did that uh, September or the fall of 63. I just want to tell you about the fact that the dean at that time, Walter Kendelsberger. Dean Kendelsberger was one of the most beautiful persons that you would want to meet up with. He was encouraging, he was kind, and he made us feel very much at home as if he wanted us there. I faced three levels of instructors. There was the level of instructors who gave you that look and saying, I really don't want you here. And that Dr. Saporin was the president of that group. <laughs> All right. Then, <laughs> I, I, I had a conference with him to straighten him out. <laughs> I talked about how much he needed me in order to keep his job because Tulane was not going to accept the fact that it would become their plight to have an instructor on their faculty who could not handle desegregation. I said, so you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you because I'm here to learn all you've got to offer. And unfortunately, you cannot teach the people who do not look like me and teach me at the same time. So that was that group. They just didn't want us here. Then there was the second group who uh, was kind of in between. Well, they, they, they're here. Let me just go and do what I have to do. And uh, you know, there's no joy in it, but I need to do this. I need this job. And so to me, that was that in-between group. And then there was a group of uh, instructors, professors, who were just very nice. And uh, it was nice to have them as instructors. So you see, there were three levels that I faced. Now, talking about Dr. Saporin, I won't go into the details uh, with him, but uh, just know that he was president of that class that um, just didn't want us here. He stands out in my mind. The encouragement 
that I received on Tulane's campus was from people who looked like me. But you've got to remember what was going on at this time. Just around a couple of corners at Crest and Woolworth, five and dime stores. You all remember that, those stores? There were people who looked like me, black students like me, who were at the counters trying to be served with their money, which was green, and it looked just like the money that others were paying for food, whatever, who did not look like them, okay? So we had uh, that. Now, here I am on this uh, campus, beautiful campus, and uh, if you've ever seen the Red Sea parted, you needed to see me walking down the sidewalk, <laughs> taking care of my business, other students going this way, I'm going that way, they're walking and talking and chatting, and all of a sudden they're looking up and here I come and the Red Sea begins to part. I have the whole sidewalk for myself. Okay, my encouragement on this campus came from three persons. First, the custodian in the super, uh, I mean, in the uh, social work uh, building. There, I found just all kinds of encouragement. She was, you may call her, the janitor. And um, she would say every time I passed her, she would say, oh, uh, she said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you're here. You just, you just keep on doing. It's gonna be okay. I'm looking out for you. And it was always in a nice, soft voice because I told you in the beginning, remember the time that we were in. We are now in 1963, okay? And this is when the South was in a turmoil about civil rights. The other source of uh, encouragement I received was when I would uh, go into the um, student center and uh, the uh, staff, I called them culinary, who served the food, made the sandwiches and that, they would, every one of them, as I remember there were three ladies and a man who was back and forth bringing the food. And uh, they would say to me every time I went in there the few times, uh, oh, we are so happy to see you. We're just so glad you, uh, that you're here. We're gonna keep praying for you so that you will do a good job. And then the third person I want to share with you was, I called him the landscaper. Others may have called him the grass cutter. And so I was on my way from Ferret Street to Willow Street one afternoon, and he was cutting the grass, and he stopped his lawnmower, and he came to the sidewalk and he said, good evening, and I said, how are you, sir? And uh, he said, um, I'm okay. He said, listen, I've been wanting to, uh, to stop you and, uh, and just you know say, close, uh, say a hello, close up, he said, uh, but today I, I just felt driven to uh, tell you something. And I said, okay, and so he said, I want you to know that um, my family, along with me, we're praying for you. I see the other ladies too, and we're praying for all of you so that uh, you will do good, do very good. And um, so I said, well, I thank you so much for that. He said, but I want to tell you something that happened. He said, um, uh, we were, uh, I was telling my uh, family about you all on campus, and my little granddaughter, uh, she said, uh, well, Papa, I thought you said where you work at that school, all of the people are white. So he said, well, they were all white until we got these three colored ladies, uh, they go to school there. <laughs> so she, he said, she said, well, how did they get 
to go, how, how, why, why are they there? How did they get to go to that school? And he said, well, uh, they, uh, they, they were obedient to their parents, they went to school, they were happy to be in school, uh, they, uh, they went to Sunday school, they listened at the preacher, <laughs> and uh, all, of those, uh, all of those good things. You gotta respect your mom, you gotta listen at what the teacher say. He had this list, this litany, so he said, um, so I told her that. So um, he said, she said to him, she said, uh, well, is that all they had to do? And, and, and he said, yes. And so she said, well, I can do all of those things. And uh, Grandpa Father said to her, yes, you can. She said, huh, I sure can do that. And now I know I'm going to Tulane, <laughs> Tulane, Tulane. And so she started a little ditty. And he said, I just wanted you to know what my grandchild saw or sees in just a picture. She's never seen you, may never see you again in life, but she saw you through her heart's eye as I uh, uh, tell, told her that you all were here. If I did not know what my purpose in life was before then, she gave it to me. I was supposed to be a model where I would make a difference in the lives of little black boys, yes, and little black girls like me. So as I left the landscaper, I had a very good feeling about now I absolutely know, there's no doubt in my mind, what my purpose is. Let me just share with you three experiences I had uh, on this journey as a, as a Tulane student, I've shared with you. Now, I'm going to share with you a couple of things that happened after. The first thing is I uh, applied for the position of secretary for the state of Louisiana Department of Social Services, which is the highest position in that department. It's a cabinet position. And uh, so I would sit with the governor and everybody else making all the laws and rules as it related to services for the state of Louisiana. And uh, so when I went to apply for the job, the final day was Thursday. I talked with my oldest son, J.H. Banks, and I said, you know, I could do that. So-and-so did it, and so-and-so did it. I could be a secretary. And so he, um, he said, oh, yeah, ma, go ahead. I said, but tomorrow's the last day for the interviews. He said, go ahead and call anyway. I did that Wednesday evening and Wednesday afternoon, and I was given an appointment to come to an interview the next day, which was Thursday at 8 o'clock. Well, I want you to know I didn't... Uh, understand what was the reason or what kind of people there were in Baton Rouge. They had to be slow learners. If they had the nerve to give me an eight o'clock appointment to come to apply for a job. And uh, didn't they know that I was coming all the way from New Orleans? Well, it was an eight o'clock appointment. My son said, you'll make it. I don't drive on the highway but I can raise hell in the city. <laughs> and, and so I got my nephew to drive me to Baton Rouge. We got there on time, ahead of time, wanted to be relaxed. And um, while we were in the waiting room, uh, I guess about 8.15, they came to get me. And um, so I went on into the room, the usual pleasantries, good morning, et cetera, um, uh, things like that. And so we sat down, and uh, it was three white men and one white woman and me. They were the interviewing team. So um, I, uh, we went through the pleasantries, uh, good morning, uh, and all of that. And so, of course, the first question they asked is, well, why do you want to be secretary? So I got through that, and all of the uh, other questions they were asking, well, we had a nice dialogue. 
And so then all of a sudden, somebody said, went to, said, well, we didn't ask you about your education. So I said, oh, I said, well, I went to Dillard University for my BA. Then I went to Atlanta University for the first, work, uh, first year on my social work degree. I said, and then I uh, received my master's at Tulane University. <laughs> you received your master's at Tulane University? Well, I didn't know that. Did you know that? No. Did you know that? No. Did you? I mean, they, they, they were just startled that a black person who was now applying for a job with them were coming to them with a two-lane degree. Well, you have to remember, I was in Tigertown. Everybody knows Tigertown, LSU. I was in the midst of LSU. In fact, the interviews were on their campus in Ple on Pleasant Hall. So here I am from Tulane uh, trying to get a job in Baton Rouge and, uh, and, and te te Tiger territory. So that was a little much. So anyway, uh, I was Miss Banks at 9 o'clock in the morning for the interview. I, was, I received a call about um, 3 o'clock that same evening. It's Thursday, same, uh, you know, Thursday. So um, I answered the phone, and the voice on the other, on the other end said, um, Gloria, and I said, yes. And she said, this is Fran. And I said, oh. And so she said, um, oh, she said, I called to tell you that uh, you have the position. And I said, what position? I mean, you know, poor me. I said, what position? And she said, oh, she said, you are now the secretary for uh, the Department of Social Services. Well, I want you to know, this is plexiglass here, but in my kitchen, my table was a glass top table, and my tables had, uh, my chairs had cushions. Here I was trying to I'm fall, slipping out of this cushioned chair, trying to grab the table, or uh, hold on to this glass table, which did not work. And so, <laughs> so she uh, you know, said to me that uh, they had uh, accepted me, that they had presented me a unanimous decision by the committee, presented me to the governor, and uh, he had accepted um, my um, my uh, request. And um, so she said, and we told him that you are a Tulane graduate. And so I said, okay, I didn't think that much of it. So the next day, the, um, the press conference, remember now, I called on Wednesday. I was interviewed on Thursday morning. I was accepted, told about the acceptance of unanimous committee presentation on a Thursday evening. And then I was asked, well, Gloria, can you be here tomorrow for 3 o'clock? The governor um, will be, uh, we'll have a press conference, and, uh, and, and we want you to be there. Everybody, the this, this secretaries who were recommended for the positions that he had accepted would uh, be uh, there for 3 o'clock. So I said, oh, sure, fine, I'll be there. So then she said, oh, no. Don't come at uh, 3 o'clock. You come at 12 o'clock uh, so that we can all have lunch together. So I was there for 12 o'clock, and um, the governor was in, in, in the private faculty dining room. And so uh, we were sitting there having just a nice conversation. And here comes uh, one of the uh, persons that I had worked with uh, at the department who was now on the faculty at LSU. And so he saw me and he came over to the table and he said, Gloria, hey, what are you doing here? Well, we went through the pleasantries. And so then I said, well, I can't tell you while I'm here and all that. And so Fran said, well, oh, you can tell him now because in a couple of, in an hour, then uh, the governor's gonna announce it. So I told him, um, you know, I was there for the secretary's position. Well, he just went, ballistics and joy and happiness and gave me the best 
unofficial, not requested uh, recommendation uh, to uh, the uh, persons at the table where we were having lunch. So when the governor came out, um, out of the uh, private dining room, and he passed our table, and um, Fran uh, just kind of pointed at me like that, and he said, uh, oh, okay then. He said, uh, hmm, I didn't know she was that good looking. You didn't tell me. Well, okay then. You have to know Edwin Washington Edwards to know that the man is a jokester. I mean, you know, that's just the way he is. And so at the press conference that afternoon, uh, at 3 o'clock, we had the press conference. And I want you to know that he explained or uh, uh, stated to, uh, uh, at the press conference why he had selected uh, the secretaries that he did. And in reporting, I mean, uh, sharing his decisions at this press conference, I was first, he, he had me to step out first. He read um, the information that he wanted to give to uh, at this press conference. And um, at the end of his uh, 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 explanation regarding me, uh, he said, uh, he started to walk away from the mic and, and, and then he said, oh, by the way, uh, she's a Tulane graduate. Well, you know, some in the audience kind of applauded and others, you know, it was a joke. He said, eh, you know, I'm in Tiger territory. So I shared that with you uh, for the audience information, but I also want uh, the uh, administrators or whoever is here representing uh, Tulane University. I know very well, because you see, I'm very smart, <laughs> and I know very well that that Tulane University degree made a difference, a positive difference in my getting that job. I do not kid myself about that. I think if I had said I was from another university, no matter how prestigious, it would not carry, not would have carried the same weight that the Tulane University uh, a, a degree had. And so I applaud Tulane University, and I applaud you for the desegregation of this university with class and, and, and acceptance and compliance with the law, although you were not being sued as a private university at that time, I applaud Tulane University. I am glad to be a greenie. I support us, I uh, cheer for us when we are at sports games or whatever. And I want you to know also that when they're playing football or whatever, and the players out there look like me, yes, I cheer loudly because I know, I know that if they are there and playing sports, they've got to be better than the best. And guess what? They look like me. And that makes a difference all together. I share with you this one last uh, story, and that is there was a client, a lady, who went to the welfare office uh, for services. And um, when she was interviewed by the uh, worker at the end of the interview, and it was in the wintertime, she had a coat and had shifted her, taken her coat off and all of that. Um, at the uh, end of the interview, she was told that she did not qualify. Uh, they were sorry. And so she uh, was getting up, she was upset, she was mumbling, and she said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell, I'm gonna call and tell Miss Gloria. So the worker said, Miss Gloria? What Miss Gloria? Who is Miss Gloria? And so she said, huh, you don't know who Miss Gloria is? That's that. Uh, a lady 
in Baton Rouge with that big old job and she works with the governor, yeah, I'm going to call her. So the worker said, well, how do you know this Miss Gloria? And Miss Gloria, and so uh, <laughs> she said, well, Miss Gloria lives next, uh, if, um, I live next door to Miss Gloria's friend and she visits there all the time. Whenever Miss Gloria comes by, well, Miss Gloria always speaks and say hello uh, and all of that. So the, the worker said, well, let me go and get my supervisor. So she went and she got her supervisor, and the two of them came in the cubicle, and um, the supervisor said, well, let me look uh, you know, over this application again. So they did, and uh, the supervisor said, well, no, if we change this here, maybe what, and they made, made a few adjustments on, and so, she said, um, well, she said, um, Miss Sis, that was her name. She said, um, okay, she said, uh, well, uh, we had made a little error here or whatever. And she said, you, you, you're eligible. Uh, you know, you're gonna get your check whenever the food stamp. So um, she, uh, <laughs> she was getting ready uh, to go, putting her coat on and all that, and just taking her time and feeling very happy. And uh, the, uh, the supervisor said, um, said to the uh, worker, she said, um, well, before she left, before you came and got me, and she told you um, she was going to go and call Miss Gloria. She said, you don't know who Miss Gloria is? So the worker said, well, well, no, I didn't even think about, you know, Miss Banks or Secretary Banks. And uh, so the uh, supervisor said, well, the next time somebody comes in and tell you something about Miss Gloria, uh, you make sure that you take care of them in the right way. So I just want you to know, as I take my seat, I am glad to be a Tulanian. My family is happy that I'm gonna take my seat. <laughs> and I know that all of you including somebody very near me, was just about to fall off that chair, going to sleep. I saw you, and I'm not calling any names. All I know is the last name is Elwa. That's all I know. So anyway, the story may have been long, and it may not have been exciting, but it's from my heart. And I want you all to know that in 1963, it was not as it is in 2022. We haven't gotten there yet, but we are much better now than we were in 1963. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And so in doing that work, if you're committed and you're serious and you will continue, you will persevere, they don't have to know you by your last name. They will know you simply by Miss Gloria. Thank you. I actually use that name several times since I've moved to New Orleans, and it does work. Um, so I know what you mean. Um, th the next honoree I'd like to announce, but I want to say something, because when you hear, everyone goes, oh. So Miss, Miss, Miss Marilyn is from Atlanta. And the minute you mention, oh, that's the first time I heard someone go, yay, Atlanta. Um, so I have to, so the first time we met, I said, you're from Atlanta, so what about the saints. Um, she goes, oh, absolutely the saints. I don't care if I live in Atlanta. So when, that's, I want to put that caveat up there. So it is my pleasure to announce Miss Marilyn, whose name actually works in the city as well. I understand that we each, no, we were supposed to do five each. 
And from what I gather, my five have been used up. But even though you may think my time has been used, let me tell you, in addition to graduate from Tulane. The three of us usually talk like we talk because we're all Baptists. <laughs> and, you know, we feel we have a lot to say. We try to cut it short, but sometimes it just does not work. But I'm going to try to just give you some information without overbearing uh, and wearing you out. Because a lot of what's on my mind have kind of been touched on already. You know, I remember when Pearly got up, she mentioned Millie Charles. Millie Charles was my first desk mate. So the supervisor could teach me nothing because I sat <laughs> next to Millie Charles. <laughs> Gloria, you mentioned somebody at Tulane by the name of Max Sapura. You know, um, what did I say? He was a dog or, or something, <laughs> you know, but, but, but he, you know, he was not the kindest instructor. You know, uh, Gloria chose to stay and fight with him. I didn't want to fight, you know, so I went to the assistant dean, Sutherland and say, I can't deal with this man, <laughs> you know. And I think that was a lucky break for me because I was taken from his class and put in the class of Edith uh, Schulhofer, which, yes, oh wow, which was, <laughs> which I think, you know, you really needed to be somebody or show some progress in order to be assigned to her. But, uh, so that worked for me, so those are two people I think about, and I guess the other thing about Max Sapporin is in 1979, I went to do summer study at the University of Chicago, and who was sitting across the table from me? <laughs> Max Sapporin, <laughs> yeah. uh, and he kind of looked at me like, hmm. I don't and my only thing was, and my children can tell you, every now and then when I don't want to give them an answer, I simply say, do you read eyes? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I gave him the answer that, uh, yes, you do know me. But in going back and in looking at some of the things we've gone through, you know, I, my story goes back, I guess, a bit further, well, we all talked about childhood and growing up. And I think we all owe a lot to the people who influenced us as youngsters. And most people who know me, they already know or they have heard that I started talking about being a social worker way back when. You might not remember, but when I was in elementary school in the seventh grade, there was a little white form. I think it was called Form 47, I don't know. But each student had to put something about themselves on there, their name, their birth, their parent. But there was a question that said intended vocation. And on that intended vocation, in the seventh grade, I put social worker. You know, and it was like, well, what do you know about social work? You know, or what is it? And I had to scratch my head. I didn't really know. But there were a few things I knew. I had an aunt that worked with the blind, and she was a social worker. My grandmother had a neighbor who worked with the court, and she was a social worker. There was a man that used to come through our neighborhood frequently with a little black book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, a, with a little black book. And the old people didn't call him their social worker. They said, that's my committee. And you have to scratch your head and say, what is a committee? And then I found out, uh, well, the same aunt that worked with the blind told me, well, that's a social worker. He's not really a committee. But, uh, but, but, uh, but what he was doing in the neighborhood, in and out of the old people's homes, 
for people who received old age pension, as they called it. You know, and this was something, I guess, to keep them, to make sure that they were still eligible. And even when I got a job working, each year when we had a supervisory evaluation, I said, oh, you know, you get your redetermination to see <laughs> if you're still eligible. So it kind of went way back then. And another group, and I think that was really perched my interest, a group of boys. My brother and some of his friends used to go play ball back at Milne, which housed delinquent boys. And, and uh, a lot of times, a bunch of us from the neighborhood would go along and cheer for them. But something about these boys, when they talked about their social worker, they talked about all of the horrors of being a resident somewhere like Milne. But when they say, my social worker, this was a person with a positive impact on their lives. Somebody that they thought were really backing them up. Somebody who believed that they could be somebody, that they did not have to stay like that. So those were some of the things that kind of got in my mind and that I wanted to be a social worker. I knew not about a whole lot of professions, but I knew a lot of black girls when they were growing up you looked at, am I going to be a teacher or am I going to be a nurse? I didn't want to be a teacher, and I did not want to be a nurse. So the whole idea about social work stuck, excuse me, stuck with me. I, um, when I was in high school, you know, it was made clear, if you want to be a social worker, you got to go to college. You know, uh, okay, so I have to go. You know, I had grew up in a situation where it was kind of expected that you would go. It would be hard because there were not all of these grants around. My parents didn't have the kind of jobs that they could say you could go to college with no problem. You know, it would be difficult, but you, could, you can go. You can make it. And then, lo and behold, when I get into Dillon, and start looking about the, at the actual avenues of social work, I find out you got to get a master's <laughs> <laughs> to go. You got to go even further uh, if you want to be uh, the kind of social worker that you want to be. So I then started thinking about, OK, I'll get a master's. And right now, I won't go through all of the issues, because I think from Gloria and Pearlie and from whatever you've read, that there were problems for black people to try to get a master of social work degree in the state of Louisiana. You know, the only university in the state that offered a master of social work degree said blacks could attend, it could come, come to class, but they could not live in the dormitory and they could not eat in the cafeteria. So think about those two things when you think about what is it like, you know, do I have to commute back and forth every day and also go down to Woolworths to the color counter to get something to eat in the meantime? I didn't see that as a viable option. And that was when I decided I would go to Atlanta to get to go to school. So, uh, so I, I, I did that. But uh, in looking at what it was like in between time, there were a lot of headaches, but I'll just skip to the point when Gloria, uh, I'm sorry, Gloria, not you this time, when Pearly Elwy and Barbara Guillory filed suit. And then Tulane said that they would uh, accept blacks in the campus. So when I found out back in 1963 that Tulane had said they would enroll black students, I said to my family, to some of my close friends, I'm going to apply. And you can call it cocky if you want, but I said, I'm going to apply, I'm going to be accepted, and I'm going to succeed. And that was the, the kind of thinking that I had in, in, in going to Tulane. And I guess I could be that kind of cocky, if that's what you want to call it, uh, because of my upbringing and because of some life experiences I had already gone through. You know, 
I grew up with somebody patting me on the head, and I guess it's similar to, you know, you study hard, you can make it. I could remember the next door neighbor saying, you got a good head on your body, and if you just use it, you know, you'll be all right. You know, I, I grew up with people saying things like, if you study hard and you work hard, you could be anything that you want to be. I could hear people say, oh, not everybody. You're going to come into people in this life that's not going to like you. But in this life, not everyone will like you. Life is not a popularity contest. It doesn't matter whether they like you or not. But if you live, and I won't say if you live. My grandma used to say, if you carry yourself in such a way, they'll have to respect you, whether they like you or not. So that was another thing that I thought about. Another kind of adage that I got was, don't let anybody make you feel less than you are. You know, you are a good person. I want you, and that was always stressed by my mama, you treat everybody right, you know, but uh, don't let them put you down either. And sometimes, maybe I'll, <laughs> this is a little side step, share with you, you know, that, okay, I was overweight. <laughs> so when you talk about people putting you down sometimes, you know, this could be a part of it. And sometimes it would make you feel kind of bad about yourself. But I had a family, especially a grandmother, who said, no, honey, don't let that get you down. And don't let anybody see that they are getting under your skin. She said, in fact, what I want of you, the downer you feel, the higher you hold your head. <laughs> and that kind of stuck, that this was the way. You know, when you dealt with people like Max Apar, you had to keep your head up. <laughs> you, you, had to, you, you had to keep your head You had to keep your head out. So that had, that had to go. So, so that part of my upbringing prepared me for Tulane in 1963. It prepared me for the world I had to face. But in addition to my upbringing, I had had several life experiences that moved me in that direction. I think when I, I pointed out in, the, in my bio, when I first started looking for social work, there was an opening at Charity Hospital. The charity was the biggest hospital in the state. And they needed a social worker. And I had had field training in Atlanta with a health department. So I just knew I was ready. I was very optimistic. The interview went quite well. And Gloria, you know, at that time, I didn't have a Tulane <laughs> degree. <laughs> so, but the, um, the, the director of social services seemed to be impressed. And she told me so. And she would get back to me with the results. Well, I got a letter two days later that said she had presented my situation to the board and they didn't beat around the bush. They simply said Charity Hospital was not ready for a colored social worker. You know, so that uh, kind of went out, out of the window. And there were some other issues, but one that stands out vividly in my mind about being prepared to come to a school where they had not had black students before. I worked at the welfare department, and when I got the job at the welfare department, there was a two-week orientation period in Baton Rouge that you had to go to. When I went, I was the only black among 24 new hires at that orientation. There were four instructors who were all Caucasian. So here I was in that situation it was a very, very trying time. But I could use even the things I had taught, I was taught growing up, in that as well. 
I've always kind of expressed my opinion. If I have a value, you, I see somebody, yes, I still do. <laughs> uh, if I have something that I want to say or something I believe in, I'm going to say it. You know, and I had a tendency to do that. My saving grace, I think, maybe in, because I don't think I would have made it through orientation if it had not been for just one of those senior instructors in that orientation, Paul Bennett. And he kind of understood where I was coming from. He knew what it was like. In fact, sometimes I think he egged me on because when somebody would say something <laughs> off the wall, you know, example like, if you give these people that welfare, who am I gonna get to iron my white shirt? You know, and Paul Benner would say, Marilyn, what you think about that? That was the throw that I needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, but all in all, throughout all of that, you know, that is, I think I would not have made it off that uh, orientation period if it had not been for Paul Benner. I can't prove it, but I think he was the one who spoke up for me or who probably cast a, a deciding vote that I stayed and I continued on that. And even then, I read when Gloria was talking about the maid up here at Tulane, I thought about the custodian in that state office building at that time. Because I remember one of her words to me, again, and we have to face it, when people see people like us doing what we're supposed to do and achieve, and they are proud. And this lady did say, you know, I, I'm proud. But the other thing she said, which reminded me of my, holding my head up, she said, honey, you know, when you eat alone, nobody would guess that you are eating alone because of them. They think, you think you're too good to <laughs> eat with them. Said, you carry yourself you know, in such a way that uh, nobody would get excuse me, guess that it's because of that, that you are not. So, and I'm talking about that to say, after going through that trying time, made it much easier to move into an environment of Tulane in 1963. I could do it. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and say, work coming to Tulane was a piece of cake. I didn't have all of the hostility that that experience made me think I would have, but um, there were some issues. There were some people who were ugly, some people who looked like they were just tolerant, some who tended to have a kind of condescending attitude. You know, uh, there were some who were really, I felt genuinely gracious and friendly. There was some, and I could think about a couple in particular, who were overbearing in their efforts to make you feel comfortable. You know, they'd come to you every time you turn around, you know, everything okay, what's going on? But, uh, but, but that was also something to help you along. The other part that I found discouraging were those, and especially instructors, who tended to ignore you, you know, to act like you weren't even there, to have discussions when you knew you knew the answer and you weren't included in the discussion. You know, again, that's another hurting moment. So there were some times that um, there were some problems, but you had to deal with it. There were some, I think, instructors who was super critical, you know, and I could remember this particularly of my research instructor at Tulane. But fortunately, because of the research I had had in Atlanta and at Dillard, I was on my game, you know, and no matter how hard, and I really believe he was deliberately trying to trick me up, I was able to make it through and work with it. So that was kind of my experience at Tulane. And then came graduation. You know, oh, it was an enjoyable occasion. 
there were, I don't know how many hundred graduates in that ceremony. Gloria and I were the only blacks. But I wish you had seen the blacks in the audience. <laughs> you know, uncle, aunties, cousins, neighbors, everybody. You know, one person that I always felt uh, proud that attended my graduation and did a lot of things was my barber, all the way through college and through Tulane. I got my hair cut for free. <laughs> you know, so when you're scraping for pennies, this is important that you can keep it. Oh, you, I got my hair cut. But that, you know, that was important to me. So graduation was a big thing. But I think as much as graduating, being the first black graduate of Tulane, is to be lauded, it's more important to appreciate what you did with that degree after you got it. You know, and, and I kind of feel that I did those things that, uh, that I needed to do. You know, I felt good like right after Katrina when I had come to uh, New Orleans and ran into a young lady that I had worked with as a child who was now a social worker. You know, I, I, I felt real good about that. You know, I, even in my teaching exercises, uh, a person that I taught when I was on adjunct faculty here at Tulane is now the dean of social work at Southern University, New Orleans. So, you know, I thought that, you know, I felt very, very good about that. But my whole thing in caring about people was the thing that brought me to Tulane, to brought me into social work in the beginning. You know, when I came into Tulane, I was very, very clear about my goals of wanting to work with people, of wanting to enhance my skills in working with people. But not only that, I wanted to work with people on a broader level. I had worked some in uh, the state system before coming to Tulane, which opened my eyes to some of the lack of services or to the underserved population. I knew that to do the things we needed to do, we could not always look at the client as being the problem. There were problems that existed outside of the individual that we needed to look at making systems change, a problem that we still, 2022, still face, uh, still face today. In fact, when uh, I woke up this morning, lo and behold, and I do have a tendency to sleep with the TV on, but the news was on this morning. And I don't know what has gone on recently in Louisiana's uh, Office or Department of Children, Youth, and Family Services. But whatever it was, the headline this morning was the secretary was resigning. You know, so I guess, and it still lets us know that in this world, there is still a lot that needs to be done. You know, uh, we look at the need, and that's one of the things that I hope to get from Tulane, to strategically advocate for systems change. And I guess honestly, when I was in Tulane, everything was really focused more on casework and on psychotherapy <laughs> rather than changing systems. But even in looking at that coursework, it broadened my understanding that changes needed to be made if we want to make sure that the underserved population gets served. And I stayed in that direction. So even with that, I saw the needs that still exist and that it's not always the clients that needs fixing. Sometimes it's the situations that they're in. And uh, I remained uh, to do whatever I could to bring about change in the lives of everybody. 
And I can honestly say today that I have remained steadfast in my values, my beliefs, and my goals, while at the same time utilizing and building on those strengths that I acquired at Tulane. They, were not to be, they may not have been all I thought I wanted all that time. You know, and I've, all, I've also been accused by people of thinking, I think my way is the only way. <laughs> And, 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 you know, and I know that might necessarily be true, but I have learned that I can take a little bit from here and a little bit from there and a little bit from somewhere else in order to help to make this world a better place. Even after retirement, I didn't stop. When I relocated to Atlanta, the very first thing I got involved with, Children's Defense Fund and set up a leadership con uh, conference in order to help people surviving Hurricane Katrina. So I, you know, I, I worked on that after all uh, that. And that, that, it was very interesting, very challenging. And for a while, because of what I had gotten through experience and through my time at Tulane, I became almost a one person information and referral system <laughs> to uh, Hurricane Katrina victims that found themselves in Atlanta. One of the big things I've been constantly involved in in the past few years, I co-chair a community action part or arm of Lithonia County's Association for Retired Citizens with the AARP. And in fact, I, we laugh. <laughs> early on when we talked back in whatever, 2019 or whatever, when we were going to do that. The first thing my AARP group said, oh, well, we're going to get a bus and we're going to come down to New Orleans for that <laughs> unveiling. But, uh, but I did send them the link that this was going to be uh, uh, on, on Streamline today, so whoever wanted to. But it's, it's those kind of things. So. I find myself working, and yes, I have gotten a little older, but you know, I, I, I'll just say, you know, at age 85, I still find myself actively engaged with individuals, groups, and communities. It's my life. I started back sometime before seventh grade, and here these decades later, that's where I see myself. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Marilyn, Miss Glory, Miss Pearlie. It's amazing just to be in the room with you. I've got to do this for two years. Um, quite frankly, sometimes I was scared. Um, when, you, when you hear their stories and, and get an idea, how do you convey this energy? How do you convey the pain? How do you convey hope? I was just baffled what to do. But I had an ace up my sleeve that I didn't realize. When I moved here in 2016, our house had flooded twice in Houston. So I had been through the floods. And it should be a terrible time. Well, I went into a gallery on Magazine Street and saw these Katrina paintings that was clearly showing Hurricane Katrina with these vivid, beautiful colors. So you knew there was devastation, but the colors gave you hope. And I remembered that, and after about two weeks of going, how do we do this project? I knew Terrence Osborne was the person that could convey a journey and end up with hope and perseverance, like no one else could. I could think of all types of things, and so, it, the, the artist selection process took a while because trying to figure it out. First, I wanted to see if Terrence was even able to do this. As you know, he's an internationally known artist. He's done, if I get it wrong, I'm going to say six to seven Jazz Fest posters. Um, he's done Barks Root Beer. He's done Heineken. Terrence, you walk around with Terrence. Everybody knows Terrence. Born in Charity Hospital. I wanted a local artist, right? So I really wanted to blend this community feel into this work. And so I went in and said, I, I want to do a commission with you. Didn't tell them what it was till we sat down. I told two sentences of who we were going to honor 
He said yes. Like, it was that quick, and I was sort of like, I wasn't expecting that. So <laughs> the nice thing, I've seen the love that you three have for one another, and Terrence and I have become brothers through this process. We are great friends. I love him like a family member. We talk not just about art. We talk about the civil unrest. We talk about our families. We both have teenage daughters. A lot to talk about and unpack there. Um, <laughs> He's taught me a lot, and I've taught him a lot. And you three, actually, your joy and your love has actually infected us to become, hopefully, lifelong friends like you all have. So I have the joy and pleasure to introduce my friend, my brother, Terrence Osborne, who can tell you a little bit about the painting. Oh, wow. Thank you, Patrick. Um, of course, it, it's an honor for me. I feel so lucky to be able to de depict the Trailblazers. Um, and one thing that, that I loved when we first started talking about what to do, um, they said, the lady said, we don't want portraits, right? We don't want the traditional sit-up portrait kind of thing, which is perfect because I love telling stories. But I think that if you there are two things that make a good painting or a good piece of artwork. One, when you see it, it's like, wow, right? You get the wow factor. The other thing is, conceptually, it has a good idea, right? Um, and, and it can tell the story in the simplest way. It's just like, you know, like a song that you love. You know, there's simple words, and it gets to the point, and uh, that's what makes a success successful piece of artwork as well. So do you want to un unveil it now? All right. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. Well, you, yeah, you could if you'd like. So, so thank you. I, I'll tell you the quick story about it. Um, so if you look at the buildings, the three buildings represent the three stages of Tulane in the integration process. The three ladies here. Now, they, I, I made each of their outfits a different color so that they can decide who they were. <laughs> so I, I believe Ms. Gloria is the red, right? <laughs> The fire, yeah. And I'm not sure which ones you guys picked, but well, anyway, the, you see the three ladies here. Notice the two-lane sign on the building. It's the, the building's dilapidated. There's barbed wire. Um, it, there's no, there are no stairs to get in. It, it's uninviting, right? It's nighttime as well. 1960, you see the address there, right? That was the year. There's a tree with... This, this tree here is um, it's a rotting or, or a broken down tree, but there's still a sense of hope because you see the, the little three leaves on there uh, representing the three women as well. Um, also, the lights are still on, so that's another sense of, of hope. You go to the next stage, and this is the address on there is 1961. 1961 is when the ladies went to court. Um, you see the plans in their hands. They're, they're working it all out. S School of Social Work is on the back of the guys, the, the workers, their shirts, SOS. At the same time, the, the two-lane sign is being renewed. It's becoming daylight. The stairs are being worked on. The, a tree is being planted right there next to the house as well. The final one is the graduation, celebration. Um, and the tree is, it's also reminiscent of that, that two-lane tree with all the beads on it. You've seen that one. Um, 1963 is the address. The three ladies are there. There's a cameo of some guy holding the bass drum right there. <laughs> so 
So that's, that's Patrick. He, he had no idea I was going to put him in there. <laughs> Funny story, because I, I, I said, um, I was like, what do you think of the last part when I showed it to him? He was like, oh, yeah, it's great. I love it. And I was like, okay, well, what do you think of the drummer? Oh, he's attractive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was great. Um, so, the, so the title of the painting is The Trailblazers. And I'm so happy to do it. Thank you so much. One of, one of the other honors, there's a lot of surprises today. There's still more. Um, not just me being on there. I literally had no idea. Um, no, I did. I did. That's a true story. She didn't know. 100% true story. And I'm looking, he's going, and I'm crying when I'm seeing the painting because it truly tells their journey. And I move, and he keeps looking at me going, and? And? And I'm standing in his living room. I'm going, what? I like it. Stop. You, you, you know, your, art, your work's good. You should open a gallery, right? You know? And then he keeps going, he goes, look at the bass drummer. And I like lost it. I was just like, no way. So it's, it's truly an honor. Um, and one of the other things we wanted to do in the president um, as trailblazers is to present each, and, each honoree with a medal, a trailblazers medal, as an honor from Tulane University. So I'd like Provost Foreman to present each honoree with one of these medals. They're all later. Yeah. And there's, there, there, there's some more. We're, we're going to get some photos. We're going to get some photos as well. But one, one thing that we wanted to as a school and a university as well as Terrence, um, what, and the dress colors are very important. Now, we are not going to get in between the fighting over which colors. We're just not. We've, we've been there with you all. Um, and we will lose. But it's very important. So, Arturo, could you bring one of them out here? So we actually worked with Terrence and you each will have a G clay of this painting. Wow. You want to talk about the colors? So each of these G clays, so if, if you're at all familiar with what a G clay is, a G clay is a high-end reproduction on, that I, I print on canvas, so it's printed and then I paint on top of it, right? Uh, so, so that's so, you know, the artist touches it and signs it as well. Um, now, each one of these, they're double framed, so all of them have a black frame, all three of them have a black frame, but the inner frame is the, the color of the trailblazer. So, this one has a blue, so whoever is blue, this is yours. And it, yeah, there's a red one and also a yellow one. <laughs> and so, one, one of the things that would make Terrence and I lose sleep is they kept saying, we, the university as well as the school has dedicated the third floor, the Trailblazers floor, in their honor. So this floor will always be known as the Trailblazers floor. And about six, eight months ago, we were having a meeting because we would get together during the pandemic for Zooms just to check in and you know, feed our souls, and it was always great. The meetings were an hour, but they'd always be two hours, and we would just talk about all kinds of, all kinds of things. Terrence and I didn't talk much. We just listened. Um, but they kept saying, how will we know that this is the Trailblazers floor? How will we know? 
So I had a plan and my daughter, who is a first generation Chinese uh, student who's now applying to Tulane, um, her and Terrence, if you came off the elevators, you'll notice that there is a black and white image of this painting as a mural on the wall. And then you'll notice letters that are in high color, matching a lot of the colors in the painting. My daughter worked with Terrence and the two of them created that piece together. So that was another thing. So how do we know it's the Trailblazers floor? I don't know how much bigger I could get. Um, <laughs> other than standing there for the rest of my career going, there's three Trailblazers, no. But it was an honor to have my daughter who actually had to go back to high school. She was here earlier. But we wanted to make sure that this was a theme. It involved families, it involved people, it involved New Orleans. And I can think of no better way and no better people to honor. Um, I'm gonna close with here. Um, your legacy at Tulane and in social work is phenomenal. We all should follow your examples of being kind to one another, loving your friends and always being in contact, and always teasing and having fun with one another constantly. The other thing I want to think about is you've paved the way for all types of students to be at Tulane, not just in social work. My daughter, who is starting in the spring at the School of Science and Engineering, she wouldn't be in that position if it wasn't for you. So personally, I thank you for that journey for her. And the last thing, which is most important, this is New Orleans, it's food and cocktails and things. Tomorrow night, we can't just end here. There's no more surprises. Hopefully this is no. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we're gonna have a reception here at the school. Faculty, staff, students, community members, friends, family, everyone will gather here at 5.30 to 7.30 to celebrate our honorees once again and do it in New Orleans style. So I wanna thank you all for being who you are and enriching my lives and the lives of others. And also thank you to Tulane. One, one more thing, one more thing. Oh, okay. I, I knew I wouldn't get the last word in. I, I, So I, 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 I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to create, create a, so. Have a great evening.